Hey everyone, this is Nimblecork from Shilmagognar and recently I've told you that I wanted to do an Ask Me Anything video. I hope all of your questions will be in here today. Um, I will be using a randomizer. I'll do my best to get as many of them covered as possible and uh, we'll see how the video goes. So let's not waste any time and get to the questions. The first question is from Powell. What bands inspired you most? Well, originally, as I was starting out with Shilmagognar with my pal Skerge, uh, I was still very much in my Metallica and Iron Maiden phase. Uh, however, as I was uh, building my style for Shima Gognar, I did discover bands like Immortal. Their album At the Heart of Winter is one of my favorite of all time. I also really like the first two albums by Dimi Borgir. They had a lot of atmosphere that I've never heard in, every, in any other band since. Death was a gigantic inspiration for me. Death, I felt, was very uh, freeing itself from limitations. It, it jumped from riff to riff whenever it felt like it. He was a real trailblazer, in my opinion, and also the musicians that he chose to work with were all top-notch. Uh, however, I was not just in, inspired by metal bands. Uh, I would say I was more inspired by video game soundtracks than metal bands. I grew up with a Commodore 64 as a kid. The soundtracks to some of those games were, in my opinion, absolutely mind-blowing because back then they had a very strong limitation on uh, on what you could do with the sound chip in, in there. So usually you would expect very basic, very simple music. But of course there have been composers on that system as any other. They took the limitations of that of that chip and just blazed around it. It was just amazing. And I'm speaking about people like Jeroen Tal, uh, I think it was Rob, Rob Hubbard. There, there were many others as well, but those are the first two that come to mind for me. And then there were also musicians that inspired me while I was a kid. Uh, one of the biggest ones was Kate Bush. There was a song by Kate Bush, I think it was called Cloud Busting. And it had an army marching at the intro, at the outro. Kate Bush always had a very unique dreamlike quality that I haven't heard in any other band since. And that that frightened me as a kid. Of course, when you're a child, your imagination is very strong. And um, when I heard that march of those uh, of those soldiers, I felt like they were coming for me. They were marching straight towards me. So I would be hiding under the bed, listening to that song over and over again. But for some reason, I still liked listening to it. I loved it. It just frightened me. Next question. Thurnin asks, what's your favorite video game and why is it Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin? Sorry. Are you though? Well, actually, I, uh, all jokes aside, I do like Dark Souls too. Uh, it's mostly just some enemy placements, some bosses that didn't really do much that I found a little bit disappointing about that one. And graphically, it looks a bit flat compared to the other ones, but I still like it. So what is my favorite uh, video game of all time? Probably Diablo 2. If you would tell me there's only one game I can play for the rest of my life, I would choose Diablo 2. Of modern games, I think my favorite is Bloodborne. No other game has an atmosphere like that to me, and I think it's absolutely amazing. Next question. Alex asks, it's been asked above, will you play live? If so, who would you bring on stage with you? A, for real, or B, who would be your dream team, dead or alive? And this is a very common question. Um, this question will reoccur, so I'm just going to skip over it. Uh, sorry for the people who asked, by the way. The answer is no, I will not play live. It's not because I'm just a single person. It is partially for health reasons, but also, honestly, I just don't care for playing live. I don't like live music. I don't visit live music much. I maybe go to a concert once every three years, even less maybe. It's not my thing. What I really enjoy with music is if I'm sitting here in this room or any other room by myself and I'm playing on the instrument, at some point I get into this, in this zone, right, in this flow. It's like there's a stream that's always happening, but you're not connecting to it. And as soon as you do, you feel that click and you just you just glide along with that stream. That to me is what music is all about. I have played live in the past and I never once felt that click. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. I'm still going to answer your uh, uh, your question about who my dream team would be if I were to play live, though, because I think that's a fun one. Like said before, Death was a major inspiration for me and uh, some of the musicians on those albums were my absolute favorite and are my absolute favorite. Uh, Gene Hoagland, amazing, amazing drummer. really like his accents on uh, on cymbals while also just having absolutely crazy precision on the feet and the hands. Uh, Steve DiGiorgio, same reason. I've seen a, an interview with him recently. I think he's doing a... Uh, he's currently playing uh, Death songs live again. I, I forgot the name of the project, I'm sorry, but um, they're doing an amazing job, sounds really good. 
and he is uh, one of the best bassists in metal in my opinion his his playing is completely out there just doesn't sound like anyone else so yeah that would be the the drums and the bass when it comes to the guitars i would probably go with uh, with two of my friends either jure from thurnen who i've been working together with for quite a few years now and i think he's a very dedicated musician and uh, and a good guitarist check out his project thurnen by the way it's great the other one would be my friend b who I've been playing guitar with for for quite a few years. I feel like he has a very similar uh, approach and, and love to music as I have. At some point, he even almost was the uh, the other guitarist on Shema Gognar, so, uh, you know, why not? Seems like an obvious choice. All right, next one. Brian asks, I know this might be a strange question, but the band name, where did you guys dig that up? Love your music and your distinctive talent. Thanks, man. And fight your oppressing government. So yeah, the band name. My former bandmates Kerge and I uh, came up with it while we were in high school and we wanted to pick a band name that really described the music that we wanted to make a little bit otherworldly. We had some other band names, I can't even remember them anymore, but they were just like an English word. But I always just felt used up already. The word already exists. How can you make music about something that's not of this world and then name it something that is of this world? And I can't remember why, but we decided to pick syllables. We wanted to combine noises that to us personally felt like they had power and if you would put them in the right order they become even more powerful so yeah we put them in an order that felt natural to us and uh, that's how the band name was born eleonora my wife asks are you coming to play warhammer i made some coffee <laughs> next one Quinton asks, how do you feel about having your first album with 4 million views on YouTube despite being a debut album and from musicians that were not previously established? Honestly, mind-blowing. I still can't believe it to this day and it has been nearly a decade now. Shilma Gochnar to me has always been this, this homebrew project which we're doing for ourselves. You're just building on it, you don't expect anyone to care for it, but you do, intensely so. So when that album was finished, we really didn't think that it would reach anyone. We purely put it on YouTube with the thought, maybe someone will enjoy it, like maybe five, ten people, you know, maybe maybe one day a hundred people will listen to it, you know. That escalated quickly. I think within the first year we got, to, we got up to a hundred thousand views, which to me was complete craziness. And from there on it went exponential and uh, kind of never stopped growing. To this day, we're still getting quite a lot of traffic on that album. How it somehow exploded like it did and without any marketing whatsoever, we posted about it on the forum two or three times, I think. That's all we did marketing-wise. It just it just blows my mind. It's amazing. Anyone who is who is a musician in the same position as, as I was at that point, yeah, don't give up, go for it. And who knows, it might happen to you as well. Next question from Corentin, I think it's pronounced. Hello, I was wondering if, as a multi-instrumentalist, you had a favorite instrument, or like if each one of them brings you a different kind of feeling. Thanks from friends. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's mostly the second part. What I like about being a multi-instrumentalist is sometimes you get burned out on an instrument for quite a while and you don't really feel like playing anymore. But it's not the music that bothers you. It's it's just that you don't feel like playing that instrument. Maybe you're, you're, you're stuck in a rut. Maybe you're always playing the same thing. You get diminishing returns. I've found that in such moments, it's absolutely fantastic to switch to a different instrument for a couple of months and just ignore that one. For some reason, because of the way the brain works, you do progress on one instrument while playing another. You get new insights, you get new angles. Let me give you an example. I do play drums a lot these days. But when I'm playing drums, I'm playing the drums as if they were a guitar. Does that make sense to you? You put accents in places where you wouldn't have put them if you were purely a drummer. But from the perspective of a guitarist, it feels natural to sometimes just put a cymbal somewhere, just put a hit somewhere, because you would probably also play an accent on a guitar in that moment. Same goes the other way around. When I play a lot of drums and then I start playing piano, I see the piano for the percussive instrument that it is, and I pay much more attention to the attack, the release, just the timing in between the notes of the, of, of the piano, less so than the notes themselves that are being played. And you kind of grow across all of them as you go through them. Right now, my favorite instrument is the drums, 
but that is because drums are my weakest instrument. Well, next to the violin. Violin, I'm really weak at them. Uh, I really enjoy the frustration because frustration, I've discovered, is absolutely the feeling of growth. When you're feeling frustrated, that's good. That means you're doing something right. That means you're doing something that your brain is not used to, that your body is not used to. So you will make progress and probably very, very fast. Next one. Christina asks, favorite dinosaur? Power thesaurus. Very useful. Matt asks, who is your favorite metal musician and non-metal musician? I have to think about that one. Metal musician? Chuck. Do I even need to say more? Chuck. Uh, non-metal musician. I don't know if he's my favorite, but I'm just immediately going to uh, Jean-Michel Jarre. He was a big inspiration as well as a kid, so yeah, let's go with that one. Uli asks, two questions from me. One, do you like to watch reaction videos on YouTube to your songs? And if so, what is your reaction to the reactions? Two, your MBTI type. Okay, I have to do that, uh, that test after I answer this. Uh, so do I like reaction videos to my songs? Yes, I do. I think they're a very good indication for me to see whether my intentions are getting across. And to do that, it really helps to see someone's face as the song is happening. You know, when, when someone writes you about listening to your song, you get the end result, you get the conclusion, but you don't get the journey. Well, Shilma, in my opinion, is a journey. So the individual stages of the journey matter to me as much as the entire thing. So it's very interesting to me to see how does someone respond as that stage moves into the other stage. The better reaction videos, in my opinion, pay a lot of attention to that and also try to elaborate on it while it's happening. So that's something I really enjoy. Uh, what is my reaction to their reaction? Sometimes I would really like to be there just to give them a nudge because sometimes people really get stuck on something. They're making a statement that's exactly what I want them to make, but they don't understand that they're making it. And that's very frustrating. Imagine you've made, made a painting, you call it the forest, and you've made it entirely green. And everyone's just looking at it like, why? Yeah, why green? Why not red? Because it's a forest. That's how it feels like in those such moments. And I really, really wish that they would draw the conclusion, but they don't. Maybe that's my fault, I don't know, but uh, you know, also people are just different. Uh, I have, uh, by the way, I have absolutely no problem with, uh, with any criticism that's made in those videos. That's very helpful in general. Most people who make those videos, they just want to give their reaction to things, give their feedback, and I'm sure they love music or otherwise they wouldn't be spending so much time with it. Generally, critic criticism is either useful because it might be something that I already wondered myself and when I see them reacting to it in exactly the way that I feared that means to me okay that's something that I need to work on for future albums. That doesn't mean I take every criticism to heart. Generally there's certain choices that you make in a project. You cannot please the entire world that's absolutely fine but let's say common example I choose to use growled vocals, screamed vocals, raspy vocals. That's a choice. That's not something I did by accident. I didn't stumble into using those vocals. I've tried clean vocals and I did not like them. I know that there will be some people that hear that and go like, well, I like the music, but I hate screamed vocals. That's understandable. I didn't always like screamed vocals myself. When I started out with metal, I thought they were just a bit too abrasive, you know? But um, that's the kind of criticism that's just not really going to change anything you do because you already considered that and you decided to go your way. You just have to get used to not being able to please everyone. One thing I don't like in reaction videos and anywhere else really is that many times people feel a very strong need to compare everything you do to something they know. They kind of seem to assume that I do know that as well. And that's a big mistake to make because, quite frankly, I can almost guarantee you I know far less bands than you do. I don't really listen to music all that much. I make music. To me, that's very tiresome to hear a comparison to other people who may have done something that was somewhat like what you did. The implication being that you're probably inspired by them or worse, you're just straight up stealing from them. There's just no connection there at all. All right. Also, here are the results of my personality test. And two of the questions hit home a little bit too much, so here you go. All right, next question. Uh, Davide asks, what do the No Child of Man Could Follow lyrics talk about? What's their meaning? Uh, first of all, they were written by my former bandmate Skirge, so I cannot answer this perfectly. 
but I do know what it's based on. Uh, he describes that at some point in his life, he had kind of like a crisis of not knowing where to go and what to do. And in important moments of that rumination, uh, a raven would come down from a tree or from a, from a roof and, and, and swoop by in front of him. Uh, ravens are known in, in folklore as messengers of the gods. I'm not saying that he actually believes that the raven was a message of God. I don't think he's the kind of person to believe that. But he was inspired and intrigued by that. And um, it happened multiple times. I think it happened three times. So I think what he wanted to do was to translate this, these happenings into a story where a protagonist was stuck in some kind of, uh, of, 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 of struggle or madness. And three times a raven would come to him and show him a revelation, give him a vision in the hopes that it would help him find what the answer to his struggle would be. Uh, what the song means exactly to him, I don't know, but I think that's the core gist of it. Erica says, Sporty Spice, really, you have no taste. Well, Erica, I'm sorry that you do not recognize the raw talent that is Sporty Spice. Ben asks, if you could cover any song by a band or musician completely different to your style, what would you pick and why? Probably some kind of a uh, video game soundtrack like uh, Unreal. I really like the, uh, the soundtrack to Unreal. I think it's very atmospheric. Stephanie asks, the upcoming album is the last of a trilogy, but it won't stop there, right? Will there be more music down the road? Yes, no worries. Uh, it's, I definitely have no intentions of stopping here. The trilogy was simply the thing that uh, my bandmate and I had in mind when we started this project, and that's finished now but that has no implications for the future of the band at all. If anything, I think it's going to be very nice for me because I have a, 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 an enormous amount of, 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 of loose riffs and concepts lying around, which so far I've not been able to use because they did not fit the, uh, the story of the albums. I'm not sure yet which direction I'm going to go with, but I will probably not be doing another trilogy because that was just way too much. I think we really underestimated how insane that is. But the next album may be another concept album, just of a different, uh, different topic. We'll see. Antonio asks two questions for me. The first one, have you ever accidentally summoned a demon by speaking the name of the band? Actually, we put it in an order where it cannot do any harm. Beforehand, we kind of accidentally changed the, uh, the outcome of time and uh, yeah, that's what's happening right now. Sorry, guys. It won't happen again, but don't change the order. And the second question was about the uh, the Emergence Final, whether that will be available again soon. I'm sorry, I don't know for sure. Emergence Final was re-released, reprinted very recently, I think in June, and it sold out extremely quickly. And the thing is, I don't make the decision of doing reprints. That's done with the label. And I've already told them that I think it's a good idea not to wait two years this time. I would suggest just uh, drop them a message if you would like that. I think if enough people do that, they will probably see that there is enough uh, demand for it and uh, hopefully do another edition. There's also a bonus question. What's your favorite planet? Doesn't have to be in our solar system. And why? Um, I think I'm going to go with Saturn. Not for any other reason than... When I was a kid, I loved to draw planets. Every every little boy probably does. And um, I just always put a ring around everything because I think it looks amazing. And Saturn is one of the most surreal looking planets of the solar system. Duncan asks, I have only one question, my friend. How are you doing? I think I'm doing pretty well. It almost feels strange for me to say that because I haven't felt like that for over a decade. I am very prone to just depression and stuff like that doesn't stop me from doing the things that I'm doing, but uh, I, I rarely ever consider myself happy. I would, let's put it that way. Uh, but right now I think I'm fine. I'm raising a kid together with my wife. That's going great. Um, music is doing well. I'm doing videos. That's something completely new for me. And uh, I'm glad that people enjoy them so far. Maxims asks, sorry for the out question. Can you make money with your music? I think that's a very relevant question, especially for other musicians that may be aiming to uh, to do similar things. Um, as you would probably expect, the answer is yes, but I'm only a single person and I own the full rights to my first album, so I make enough with it. 
if you live in a big city and you have heavy expenses, it's probably going to be tough and you'll probably need to have some life success as well as uh, as album success to be able to sustain yourself. Another thing is also uh, I run my own uh, home studio here and I also do projects for other people those also pay uh, for a lot of the things that i do so to me it's it's like the band together with being an audio engineer is enough to uh, to sustain both my projects and myself but if you take any of those away and um, you are let's say you are a five-man band i think that's pretty common right four five people in your band i think it's going to be rough to be honest danny asks i have a question why does your music sound so good at four o'clock that's because it was written at four o'clock. That's just the time that it was intended for. Antonio drops in with the big question right away and asks me, what is the meaning of life? I'll get back to that after this one because there's another question. Do I like to dance? I do like watching people who dance really well, but I am just absolutely not trained in that at all. I do move a lot during anything. Like I'm always just making movements, uh, drumming on, on, on things. So I guess I do have like a um, a certain unrest in me, which would probably be treated by dancing more. I guess you could say potentially, yes, I do like to dance. So the meaning of life. Um, had an interview question this week who asked the same thing and gave me some time to think about that. And uh, first of all, let me start off. Like, I think it's a, it's a bit of a, uh, a chicken uh, or egg question. Meaning is probably not inherent in existence because we came up with meaning. That's just something that only we know what it means. However, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Sometimes we just give terms to things which are not really one thing, but a collection of things. And I think meaning is like that. I do ever very much think that because there is no uh, preset answer to the meaning of life, that means that it can be assigned by people. I always think of uh, of when you see uh, someone with their child on the street, you have never seen that person before. Neither that person nor their kid has any real meaning to you. To you, they are just people. But to each other, they're probably the most meaningful, important thing in the world. So do they have meaning or do they not have meaning? Or both. It's an individual assignment. You can basically pick anything in life that you like and say this is the meaning of life. You're gonna die eventually anyway, it doesn't really matter. So you might as well sink your teeth into that and just really really dig in and see what you can find. And there is where the meaning of life lies for me personally. I think a lot of things in existence are built from very simple, very basic building blocks. But somehow when you put them together, there is a certain rise of complexity, which is somehow much greater than the sum of its parts. That's also why the first album is called Emergence, by the way. That's what Emergence is. It's the, the arisal of complexity from simple parts. I like to watch things that are simple grow into something that is complex. Could be anything from a community to someone who's uh, playing music, of course. Individual notes are somehow, when you put them together, they, they have a big impact on you emotionally. They may change your day, they may change your life. How? It's just the vibration. Why is it that if you put these vibrations in a row, suddenly it, it, it's magic? That's the meaning of life to me, finding that complexity and that simplicity. And not necessarily trying to be able to explain it, but just feeling it, enjoying it. Juan Carlos asks, how do you come up with a guitar riff? Do you hear the melody in your head or do you noodle until you come up with something cool? Usually it appears in my head in one way or another. Sometimes through eureka moments, uh, oftentimes through dreams, and uh, it comes in, in, in certain varieties. Sometimes it's just a melody and I write it down and I build the entire, let's call it orchestration underneath it. But sometimes you just get the entire song. It just starts playing in your head. You can hear the drums, you can hear the bass, you can hear the guitar. Sometimes you can even hear the lyrics. Some of the lyrics that I use are just straight up from a dream and I wrote them down as fast as I could when I woke up. The interesting part about that one is, have you ever heard a song as a kid in a language that you didn't understand back then? Then you think of that song as an adult and now you suddenly realize what the lyrics meant because you were just mouthing them the entire time. It's very much like that. When I hear the lyrics in my dream or in my thoughts, I'm not quite sure what I'm listening to. Sometimes I have to reconstruct it 
to figure out what could this noise mean. And then usually I find a word that makes sense in that spot. Uh, but that's not to say that I never jam, especially on the first album. A lot of those riffs were just me jamming endlessly in my, in my little bedroom. Um, I think the song Emergence is almost completely built around uh, jammed riffs. And so was Eden and Ashes. Uh, but I Am the Abyss, for example, and A New Dawn, those were completely written before I uh, built them out and recorded them. Our next question is kind of related to that. Friedrich asks, what's your composition process? You are already correctly assume that this might inspire a full video. I might do something with this in the future, I'm not sure yet. Um, he asks furthermore, what are your inspirations, live events, books, bands, songs? How can we help you to come playing in several places in France? Last part I already answered, I'm sorry, but thank you. So what's the composition process? Let's say that I start with, with a riff where I only have a melody in my head. I will write down that melody in, um, in Guitar Pro. I even bought that, can you imagine that? So yeah, I'll write down the, the melody that I came up with there in, uh, in the key and the tempo that I heard them in in my head. I uh, usually write that down on the lead guitar because guitar is, I think it's kind of the center of, of Shilma Gognar. It's my main instrument. It's the one I feel most comfortable with. So that to me is my main voice. And then usually I build underneath that. I usually start with the drums because chances are if I hear a melody, I can already hear the, the beat towards it. And even if that's maybe a simple beat, doesn't matter. If I have to copy paste it a couple of times. I just want to write it down as quickly as possible to not uh, forget it. Then comes the bass line. The bass line is the soul of the music. Uh, a melody by itself is really not all that interesting in my opinion. And um, I especially like when a bass line is not too scared to, to take a step forward. So usually I write the melody together with the bass line so they have a little bit of interaction. And that's when I fill in rhythm guitars, um, pianos, synthesizers, anything else that I can come up with. And once I've done that, this will usually be a pretty simple uh, loopy kind of thing. It's not a full song, it's more like a riff. Uh, but it sounds a bit boring now because some of it is probably pretty copy pasted. So that's when I start to change small things about it, making sure that every single repetition has something different going on in it. So even if you repeat a riff four times, that doesn't mean that you repeat every single detail of it. Change one note, change one chord, add an extra snare hit on the drum. It could be anything and it doesn't have to be uh, uh, difficult. Once again, the arisal of complexity from simplicity. Small changes together add up to something which is grander than the sum of its parts. Once I've done that, that usually sounds interesting and inspiring enough that I might get a new idea for the next part that needs to come or the part that needs to come before that. So usually I can write, let's say, half the song with this uh, method. Then there usually comes a, comes the part where you uh, get stuck or maybe your inspiration for the day is just gone or you get tired or something. I never force through this. I've tried that many times, but I do keep this part that I have right now playing in my head. I force myself to play it on loop over and over again until I get sick of it. Because I've noticed that when I do that, the chances of it coming back in my, um, what's that called? When you suddenly remember something which you couldn't remember the day before, that moment. Sometimes you get a solution to your conundrum by doing that. But to do that, you really have to anchor it in your brain. It has to annoy you. Your brain will probably spit out a, a solution at some point. Uh, even better, it might come to you in a dream. And uh, those are usually the, the coolest solutions, the most creative ones, but the hardest to capture. You have to have some experience in recording your dreams, because if you've never done that before, chances are that there's not all that much clarity to them yet, and you will forget about them very quickly. Gino asks, Shil Magoknar started as a two-man band, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Is it still a two-man band today? Uh, no, it's not. Sadly, Skilge, the guy who uh, did most of the vocals and lyrics, and he also did the final song to Emergence, The Sun No Longer. Uh, he's not currently in the band anymore. That had nothing to do with the band. Uh, we're still great friends and we talk all the time. Uh, but he had to take a step back after Transience was released because around that time he moved from the Netherlands to Poland and uh, wanted to start a new life there. That's a very tiring thing to do, a very draining thing to do. He got drained to a point where he could not really bring in any inspiration, any motivation uh, for music. If it would have been one year, whatever, you know. But it ended up taking 
all five years basically and he's still working on that yeah we both agreed that that would probably just be very bad for the band to try to force that it would have been bad for both of us we always agreed that we wouldn't release something unless we could fully stand behind it and in this situation he could not stand behind his own vision he left the band without there being any hard feelings or anything in between us Luke asks, assuming survival isn't an issue, which non-Earth planet would you like to visit most and why? I've always had this, this thing, if I can't sleep, I try to think that right now there's a planet somewhere on the other side of the universe and there's wind blowing there, there's, there's earthquakes, there's sounds, smells, anything, but we are completely unaware of that still they're happening and there's just no one there to ever pick up on those and somehow that thought is very calming to me that there doesn't have to be an observer to make it worth existing so maybe it's that that undiscovered planet on the other side of the universe where i would like to be sometimes just to just to chill you know michael or michael i'm not sure how you pronounce that sorry uh asks your favorite Opav album, hmm. Morning Rise, one of my favorite albums of all time, probably top three. I like that Opav at that point were still a very young band, but definitely had this, this taste for something grandiose already. And I think it comes together so, so smoothly on that album. So it's very organic to me, the way those songs flow. I would sometimes argue that some of the songs are there on there are not full songs. They're, they're riffs that are not necessarily connected to each other, but it doesn't matter. They still sound great together. Black Rose Immortal, of course, being uh, being a favorite to many and to me definitely as well. I really like The Night in the Silent Water as well. Oh, yeah. Lord asks, being previously an independent artist, do you ever feel more constrained or hurried, rushed to release music now that a label is involved? Uh, no, not at all. Um, Napalm Records was not just any label that uh, that we went with. We had a lot of offers before them, but I said no to those offers for that exact reason. I knew beforehand that Shima Gochnar is never going to be a band where I'll release a new album every two years. I simply cannot do that because it's an iterative process. Uh, so we knew beforehand uh, we needed a label that would allow us to be ourselves and would still have the power of it of a good label to help us spread it because otherwise we've shown before in the first album we don't need a label a label would be nice if they somehow help us further so when napalm records uh, contacted us that was a very pleasant surprise because they were on top of my wish list of of possible labels we would be interested in reason why summoning summoning was a very similar project to ours two guys I don't think they ever played live, I'm not sure about that. They're doing their own thing and seem to be mostly ignoring what the other people around them are doing. And I felt that they had a very good track record. And I figured, well, this is the label they grew up with, so to say. If if they didn't get messed up by it, then hopefully the chances for us are that we also won't get messed up by it. And I'm happy to tell you now that I've been with them for, let's see, eight, eight nine years, I think. No, that's not true seven years i've been with them for seven years and not once have i felt rushed by them they are very very kind people they clearly enjoy what they're doing they're clear they clearly support what their artists are doing if anything they've been a great support for me in my time of need i have no complaints there whatsoever now currently with uh, with this album release i think it's going very nicely as well there's no meddling which i think is very important for a label as well I think they're a great label and I hope to be working with them for many more years, honestly. Simon asks, my partner wants to know if you have any pets and if so, can we see them? Yes, I have two cats. I'll uh, I'll put some pictures in the, in the video afterwards because, you know, trying to get cats in front of a camera is always fun, right? Next question, Erwin. Which band made you love metal music? Metallica, Master of Puppets was the big one for me. Um, I heard them at a, at a party, the song Master of Puppets itself started playing and I felt like lightning struck me. I felt lightning flowing through my veins, I felt that was the first time I heard something which I would call real metal and I instantly knew this is it, this is what I want to do, this will be my life from now on out. And it was, Eleonora asks, 
what is your personal favorite song of yours on any album and why? And which song do you think is the most quintessential Shilma song, the most representative, the one that you recommend to someone to give them the perfect first impression of what the music is about? As is the case with many bands, the songs that the fans like are not always the songs that the musician is the proudest of. Um, the most mentioned Shilma Gokner song by far, by a mile, is I Am The Abyss. And I do think that's an essential song of Shilma Gokner, but I do not think it's the best song. It was supposed to be the intro to Emergence. So what I wanted to do with I Am The Abyss is to set the tone to create the emotion that I felt while writing the album so the listener would get down to that level and then hear the rest of the album from that perspective. I think it does that. I think it does that very well. But for example, songs that are equally important to me are Emergence or um, A New Dawn. I think A New Dawn is the best song on Emergence. And the sad thing about that one is no one really seems to care about that song. It's very rare that I see anyone mention it. And I get the statistics from uh, from all streaming sites and stuff. And that's one of the of the poorest performing Shimmer Rochner songs that has ever been made. So that also makes the next question uh, hard to answer. Like, which is the song that you would show to someone to give them the perfect first impression? Well, if you wouldn't have told me anything, if I wouldn't know what, what, what fans like to hear, I would say definitely A New Dawn. That to me describes the entire process and the feeling behind uh, Emergence and also I think it's the song where Skerga and I uh, are like one, like one unit, one voice. But knowing now that that's the least popular song makes me hesitate to use that one as a first, uh, first time try. So I probably would still suggest I Am The Abyss despite not really agreeing with that. On the second album I think Transience is the best song. Once again, a song where both Skerga and I are on a similar level. I like his performance a lot on that song. I was worried at first because it, it was originally written as an instrumental, and I think it works well as an instrumental. So when he really badly wanted to do a vocal on it, I, I was hesitant. Well, he performed it, and I loved it, and it ended up becoming a vocal song. A life I am hesitant about, I think Life is a, a song that turned out very well. But it's a very long song and if you want to introduce someone to something you should probably go with something that's just a tiny bit snappier so they can get an impression of who you are without being forced to sit down for uh, for such a long time there's also another bonus question of hers of the same thinking namely is there any song that you in retrospect regret putting on an album and is there any song that you think is undeservedly underrated in its reception second one i just uh, uh, mentioned already also, The Shadow of the Heart, I feel similar about as well. Skerg and I really enjoyed making This Shadow of the Heart on the, on the Transients album. We knew beforehand that that would probably be a divisive song because it's, um, I guess you could say, written in a more common style than the other songs. We thought that it, uh, that it was very enjoyable, so I think that one's underrated. Is there a song that I regret putting on an album? Yes and no. The song Squandered Paradise on Emergence in my opinion, is the weakest song on that album. And quite frankly, I would not have put that on there if Skelge wouldn't have saved it. Emergence was an album that was made over a very long time. The songs that were on Emergence were written anywhere from 12 years to, uh, to half a year ago. So you'd expect that there's a certain uh, level of variance in quality there. Uh, some songs I rewrote shortly before recording, so they would be more up to snuff. Eden and Ashes, for example, is very old, but uh, was uh, both in lyrics and, and music partially rewritten to sound a little bit more on par with the rest. Squandered Paradise is probably the oldest Shima Gokner song surviving the album, and quite frankly, I think it shows. Its structure is pretty repetitive to me, not super creative. I just think I could have done better with that one. But Skerge came, did his vocals, and I liked how pushy they were. They were really quite aggressive and uh, and accusing. It kind of felt very fitting to the tone of that album. Like we are, we we don't hate people. The tone was more intended to say we are disappointed. We could be so much more than this, but look what we have wrought. That was the idea behind it. And to me, Squandered Paradise is him 
making a plea for why we are completely undeserving of even having all of this unless we improve something about that. And that's what a new dawn is supposed to do afterwards. It's supposed to turn the coin around and say some things are bad, but there might be hope. Let's work on that. So that's the that's the position of Squandered Paradise on that on that album. That's why it should be there. I don't regret putting it on there. I gr- regret my own performance on it. Metalovi Elitista, I think it says, asks, "Do you listen to doom metal? If yes, what band do you like the most?" Uh, yes, I do listen to doom metal. More the melodious kind, uh, I would say. I don't really like it when doom metal is so slow that you can breathe in between every beat. But I do like some classics like uh, My Dying Bright. The Dreadful Hours by My Dying Bright has been uh, a staple album to my wife and me for years. I really, really enjoy the original, um, I guess they were demo EPs by uh, Draconian. The thing is, because they were demos, they were a little bit unpolished but they had a very warm blanket sound to me. Um, I really enjoyed the mood that that set, and what I enjoy even more about those albums is the way that the guitar is like this weeping voice that's just constantly going on in the background. It's not super complicated, it's not super fast, but it's definitely telling a story. And that made me fall in love with that band immediately. I think some of the inspirations for Shima Gognar, uh, lead guitar, doing similar things, are probably from that band. I also like some Swallow the Sun. Haven't heard a lot of their albums. I just have some 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 random songs in a playlist uh, that I that I received from someone at some point. One of my favorite songs by them is Hold This Woe. There is this uh, this melody in there that really tears at my heartstrings, and I think it's a fantastic song. Okay, next question. Alexander asks. Let me condense this. He enjoys the music, but he mainly enjoys the instrumentals, so he has some questions about that. Well, what he says about it beforehand is, it strikes me as a different mood, and it allows for creative thinking while submersing yourself into the music. I 100% agree. That's exactly what I like about instrumentals. That's why I'm always aiming to have a very large chunk of the albums being instrumental. Did I ever think about making instrumental versions of albums? Uh, For the old ones, yes. The reason why I haven't done that was really simple. I mostly did all of the music. My mate Skirge did mostly all of the vocals. So to me, releasing an, an instrumental version of that album means you take the band picture, you cut away one guy completely, and there you go. So that's why I haven't done that. I'm not saying that will never happen, it really depends on uh, on how Skelge feels about that as well, because he may not be in the band right now, but I still appreciate his, his opinion on that kind of stuff. Uh, for my own work, I would be more tempted to do that, so who knows for this third album what will happen. Oh yeah, he also furthermore asks uh, the reason why some songs are not instrumental. Is that because they were written for both vocals and instruments together and it does not sound good when you would separate them? Uh, Yeah, that's certainly the case. Some songs are definitely written to be uh, with vocals. So I will leave parts much more sparse and I may repeat a riff more often than I usually would. So there's place to put your verses and your chorus and stuff like that. In those cases, removing the vocals to me would indeed sound empty. Would not be the end of the world though, because if you make them instrumental, you could always just exchange the voice for a lead instrument which essentially has the same role without telling you what you should be thinking. So that's what I would do if I would make a purely instrumental album. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, for that question, that was very nice. Jana or Jaina asks, if you ever come to Montreal, are you in to play Warhammer with my husband? I can provide coffee and wine. Your wife is also invited, it says. Well, that's super nice. I would love to. Um, if you provide the coffee and the wine, we will provide the biomass. Mikola asks, a lot of people in many parts of the world would like to see you. How about you do a live stream show? Maybe something like Powerwolf did some time ago. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know anything about Powerwolf, so I have no idea what they did. I'm not sure about live streams, but um, I am considering doing some something like playthroughs of some songs, maybe on multiple instruments. I think that sort of stuff is, since I'm a one-man band, it's a lot easier to make something cool out of that when it's not a live stream. I uh, don't know yet uh, what, what to do with that. Mark asks, favorite Teletubby? Uh, Tinky Winky for sure. I mean, obviously that's the talent behind the group. Joey asks, how do you pronounce Shilma Gognar? I have no idea. Panos asks, my friend, my question is this, is there any possibility to see you as a duo again? I would say there is a chance still, yes. It really depends on what's going to happen. Uh, Right now I think he quite enjoys the distance. He 
really enjoys this new album that, that I've made by myself because there was a certain distance uh, uh, to it for him. With that said, our friendship is and always has been very much built upon our mutual love for music. Skerge is a musician by himself. He doesn't just write vocals and, and lyrics. That was just mostly what happened in Schilma. He makes his own stuff as well. I wish he would release some of that stuff because some of you might like it. It's, it's, it's pretty unique, but um, I think it's pretty cool. In any case, I highly doubt that you will never hear from Skirge again. He's uh, a far too driven a musician for that. He just needs some time, I think. Mark asks, if you were a boxer, what song would you pick for your entrance into the ring? This one. Probably Act on Instinct from Command and Conquer. I think that one slams. Matty asks, when are you going to visit Sweden? Well, actually, I have visited Sweden quite a few times already, but uh, did not play a lot of guitar there. That's probably what you were asking. <laughs> Alexander asks, what kind of guitar equipment do you use? Let me show you. This is an LTD EC1000. Uh, this is the one that was mainly used on Emergence. Nowadays, I use this mostly as a standard C tuning guitar, but most Shima songs are tuned in D. This is an Ibanez RG721 with the pickups exchange for the Marzio Gravity Storms. I usually use this one for some clean passages. As you can see, the pickup is still in the uh, in the halfway up position. So when you hear a clean passage in Chima Gokner, it's oftentimes this one. And there's this one. This is the main guitar that I'm currently using for production. This is the um, LTD MH1000ET. ET is for the Evertune. This is the auto tuning bridge system. That's why I really enjoy using this one for production. Your guitar never goes out of tune uh, during a good take because you have a heavy band or anything. Very nice guitar to play with. I think this is the, the EMG8185 combo, I can't remember. One of those standard EMG combos. I use these, these guitar picks right here. These are the Dunlop Tortex. And there's this one that's an Ibanez. TCY 10E Black. The uh, reason why I have this one is because I do enjoy listening to steel string acoustics, but I don't enjoy playing them. And this one has a rather thin neck, so it feels almost like playing an electric guitar. You can plug it in, it has a pickup, so that's, so that's useful. I haven't used this one all that much yet, I think it's on one song, the C. For a bass guitar I use a LTD B55, sometimes finger picked, sometimes with, uh, with one of these, I think they're the big stubbies. It uh, really depends on the song. I think finger picking is nice for more intimate stuff and also just for really uh, loud jangly stuff. But sometimes um, when I want the song to sound almost industrially tight, I do still prefer the sound of a uh, of a guitar pick. I think Eden and Ashes was with one of these. Um, but that passage in life, for example, that quiet passage, that's the finger pick on this one. The amplifier is the one you can see in the bag, of course, is the camper. I don't use that one for everything. I also still have a couple of, uh, of, of uh, tube amp heads. I have a PV6505 standing right here next to me and also a Jet City 20, which by itself is not really a metal amp. It does go dirty, but more like heavy rock, uh, old school rock dirty. But like with the old marshals back in the day, if you just boost them hard enough with a, with a tube screamer, you can get some pretty cool stuff out of it. For cabs, I have an angle um, with V30s, a 4x12 here. Don't really use that one all that much for album recordings, though. For the recordings, I really prefer that Harley Benton over there. I've been vouching for that uh, for years now. Harley Benton is, is the Tillman brand. They're super cheap. They are real V30s, if, if you get the V30 version, of course, so you should make sure that you do. And in my opinion, they're just right up on par with some of the best caps in the, in the world. I've heard them having a little bit of a breakthrough in recent years. I see more and more studios uh, and musicians talk about them. So I hope they keep it up and keep making uh, excellent uh, caps. Uh, other than that, uh, it's mostly just a tube screamer. It's a cheaper one. It's the TS7, which Ibanez used to make back in the day. I think they stopped making these, which is a shame because the TS9 is much more expensive. Honestly, I can't really hear the difference. I think these are all good. There's many good tube screamers. Just uh, just pick one and stick to it. You'll probably be fine. Gaither Realm asks, why does life sound so catchy and make me cry every time when it comes to the calm slow part at seven minutes yeah that part i'm uh, particularly proud of that one as well i was having a bit of a post-rock uh, phase around that time and i think it's the bass line that does it that bass line was completely improvised yeah what came out in my opinion lifted it even further i'm i'm very happy with it as well 
All right, that will do it for the video, guys. I hope this were some interesting and fun answers. Again, I hope I didn't leave out too many of you because I liked a lot of questions. But uh, in any case, thank you all for, for helping me make this. And I hope to be making more videos like this in the future. Thank you all. See ya.